After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. David intoned this lamentation over Saul and his son Jonathan. He ordered that the song of the bow be taught to the people of Judah. It is written in the book of Jashar. He said, Your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice. The daughters of the uncircumcised will exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor bounteous fields. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul anointed with oil no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely. In life and in death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O oh, daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson in luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. The word of God for the people of God. Author of life, we thank you for your word, and we ask that your spirit would be with us this morning to transform us in heart and mind and soul. Amen. We've been looking for the past several weeks at what happens when humans decide to trust in their own power instead of the power of God. It began when the people of Israel rejected the judges that God had raised up among them in order to become more like the rest of the world. They set their mind on having a king and nothing, not even warnings from God, was going to change their minds. So Samuel, the last of the judges, went and anointed Saul. As we've discussed, Saul was a real king's king. He was tall and strong. He was wealthy. He fought his enemies valiantly on every side. The only catch is that being a good ruler in a worldly sense usually goes hand in hand with being a bad person in a godly sense. Saul was violent, he was fickle, and he was lawless. Therefore, Saul lost his favor in the eyes of God, and Samuel was once again sent out to anoint a new chosen one. This time, with God teaching Samuel how to look on the heart of a person, he secretly selected David, son of Jesse. David was very much not a king's king. His family was poor, he was the youngest of many sons, and he was not a mighty warrior but instead a scrawny shepherd. Of course, David would not stay a secret for long, and in short order, he found himself delivering food to his brothers in Saul's military encampment. It was here that David distinguished himself by defeating the mighty Goliath in battle. To all those gathered there, it must have seemed as though David had a death wish, because there was no way that David could win that fight. But David declared for all to hear that he would be victorious because the Lord does not save by the sword and the spear. And he was right. The Lord brought David under his hand of protection and brought low the Philistine champion. Now between that moment of triumph and our reading today, a lot has happened that we need to catch up on. Saul took his champion David and he paraded him before the people. What Saul did not consider is how popular this would make young David. And before he knew it, the refrain among the people was that Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his tens 
his ten thousands. Now, I don't know if you know this about rulers like Saul, but they don't like it when people around them get credit. They definitely don't like it when people in their inner circles start to become more popular than them. So Saul comes up with a brilliant plan to get rid of David. He decides to put him in charge of a thousand men and send him into battle against the Philistines where he will die. Not a bad plan. In fact, it's one that David will use later against one of his own subjects. But there is one teeny tiny problem with this plan. It only works if David actually dies. Instead, what happens is that David keeps winning and his fame keeps growing. And meanwhile, David is busy gaining influence within Saul's own household. First, Saul tries to marry David to his eldest daughter, Merab. I suppose either thinking that if David is his son-in-law, then he becomes less of a threat to him, or thinking that he needs to keep his most dangerous enemy as close to him as possible. Now this marriage falls through, and instead, David is given Saul's daughter Michal in marriage. But, given that it's the last Sunday in Pride Month, I would be remiss if I didn't point out who David's true love actually seems to be. It's not any of Saul's daughters, but it's Saul's son, Jonathan. After the battle against Goliath, Saul and Jonathan bind themselves in a covenant of love wherein they swear to love each other as their own soul. And as Saul's paranoia against David escalates, it's Jonathan who helps him escape the royal court. You see, Saul eventually has enough of David's presence and his growing fame, and he tries to kill him several times with a spear. David flees, and he knows that if he returns to the palace again, he's likely to be killed, and it's Jonathan is the one who speaks to his father and learns that David's fears are true. And it's Jonathan who is the one that meets David in a field to deliver the bad news. And as they depart from one another, they kiss and they weep. And they swear to one another that their love will last for generations. This leads to a time in David's life where he essentially becomes a nomadic warlord. His loyal men flock to him in the wilderness, and they spend much hill time in the country of Judah, evading King Saul and his army who are trying to track them down. And it's during his time as a rebel warlord that David acquires two new wives for himself, and his former wife is given away to another of Saul's subjects. After some time and several failed attempts to reconcile with his king, David leaves Judah, and he pledges himself and his men to the Philistines. Specifically, he pledges himself to King Achish of Gath, king of the nation that was home to Goliath. For more than a year, David and his men raid the lands of the Sinai, murdering every man, woman, and child that they come across. Because David would go back to the king of Gath, and he would tell them that he'd actually been raiding the Israelites. It's about this time that the Philistines decide to once again muster their forces against Israel. David is brought along by his king until the other Philistine commanders object to his presence. They do not trust that David will not turn against them in battle. And so David is sent back to his village, which in the meantime has been raided by the Amalekites, one of those nomadic tribes of the Sinai that he had been terrorizing. He hunts down the raiding parties, retrieves all of the women, children, and belongings that had been stolen, strikes down the raiders with a furious vengeance, and returns home. It's when he returns home that none other than an Amalekite warrior brings him tidings of the battle against the Israelites. In fact, this Amalekite claims to have been the one who delivered the killing blow to King Saul and is now delivering his crown and his armlet to David since all of Saul's sons perished with him on the battlefield. 
as thanks, David has one of his guards cut down the Amalekite, and then he begins to grieve for Saul and Jonathan by singing the song that we read today. Now again, I think it's worth noting that as he grieves for Jonathan, he cries, Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Now that's a lot of Davidic history, and you might be asking yourself, so what? What do the political machinations of a 3,000-year-old kingdom have to do with my life today? That is a fair question to ask, not just of today's reading, but of all the prophetic texts. Why do we continue to read these theo-historical documents at all, but more importantly, why do we consider them to be sacred? The answer goes back to an idea that we've talked about before. What does it mean to be the elect or the chosen of God? If you grew up in Reformed circles, the idea of biblical election probably carries with it connotations of a predestined salvation. But when we use the term election, we mean something more akin to having been blessed to be a blessing and having a responsibility to model the ways of God in the world. Ideally, we would be a positive example to the world. But there are times that we have to learn lessons negatively. That is to say that just because something is a part of our story, whether it's our personal story or our sacred story, that doesn't make it a good thing. Sometimes the scriptures instruct us by showing us what not to do. The prophetic texts often give us these negative examples of what it looks like when the chosen people of God fall short of the responsibility that has been placed on them. Some examples are pretty straightforward. Saul is a bad person and a bad king. He is selfish, he is paranoid, he is violent, he is vengeful, he can't stand not being the center of attention, and he is more than willing to throw away other people once they've outlasted their usefulness to him. When we see people like Saul in our lives, we can know that they are not to be trusted and that they are certainly not people that we should let anywhere near positions of leadership. But oftentimes, things are more complex because our lives and our world are more complex. David is the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, who is chosen to lead his people in the ways of righteousness. But even David is human. He is going to make a lot, a lot of mistakes in his life. And God is going to forgive him over and over and over again. One of the details that I skipped over today is how David finds his wife Abigail. It's during that time when he's on the run from Saul living at the hill country and at one point he's hiding out with the shepherds of a man named Nabal. Now what David could have done is him and his men could have just killed the shepherds and taken the livestock for themselves. But what he actually does is he hangs out with the shepherds for a bit, and then eventually he sends some messengers to Nabal, and he says, hey, since I didn't kill your men and take your livestock, don't you think you should give me a gift of food? He essentially makes Nabal an offer that he can't refuse, except Nabal does refuse. And as he does so, he basically calls David a nobody loser from some place that he's never even heard of. So David has his men strapped on their swords and sets out to slaughter Nabal and his entire household. Abigail, Nabal's wife, hears that David is coming and gathers up as much food as she can load on her donkeys and meets David on the road to pay him his protection fee. A few days later, Nabal drops dead, and David takes Abigail for his wife. Now between that episode and the wanton murder of men, women, and children in the Sinai, it should be pretty clear that David is not a good person. 
And yet, he is the Lord's anointed, which, as strange as it sounds, is good news. God can take someone as flawed as David and use them to work things toward the good. If God can save somebody like David, God can save any of us. But David is a ruler, and at the end of the day, rulers are going to do what rulers do. God tried to warn his people about this before they committed to kings, but if the people are going to be stuck with a ruler who isn't God, then David is at least a little better, a little less evil than Saul. David at least tries to be true to his word, and he mostly follows the law. Which brings me to the real thing that I think this story highlights for us, that really the whole tragic arc of the kings centers on. As long as you are placing your trust in the rulers of this world, then you are placing your trust in the wrong place. Saul was everything you expect a king to be, and what happens to him? He ends up dead on the battlefield. His head is cut off. His body and the bodies of his sons are hung from the enemy's walls. His armor is paraded around as proof of his death. I'm reminded in this story of the cell phone footage that emerged of Saddam Hussein's execution and of Muammar Gaddafi's corpse being displayed after his assassination. It's, it's easy to tell that you've lived an ungodly life when people rejoice in your death. But what about David's response to the news that Saul and his sons had died? This, too, reminds me of something. It reminds me of the way that our ruling class comes together to eulogize the passing of any significant political figure in our own country. Sure, maybe Saul had tried to kill David once or twice or a dozen times. And maybe Saul did prosecute a dirty war trying to find David by killing anyone that had contact with him. And sure, maybe in our own times, politicians might say the most horrible, vile things about one another while they're alive. And maybe they might order the bombing of millions of innocent civilians. But you know what? At the end of the day, who doesn't have some skeletons in their closet? Who amongst us hasn't commanded the slaughter of men, women, and children? Those in power have to stick together because they know that deep down, when the day of judgment arrives, they will be counted alongside Saul. Jesus Christ taught us that those who live by the sword will perish alongside the sword. And the final word on Saul, the mighty warrior king, is how the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. So again, I say that if you think salvation comes from any ruler of this world, you are mistaken. If you think that salvation comes by the sword and the spear or the gun and the bomb, then you are mistaken. The power of death is the power of sin, and that power is fading. The power of the cross has triumphed and is triumphing over the powers of sin and death. The power of God's grace is bringing an end to this age of kings. Mary teaches us to sing that the Lord has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and set the rich away empty. So go ahead and trust in the power of kings if you want. But as for me, I will trust in the Lord. Amen. Please pray with me. Jesus Christ, Savior, Lord, you and you alone are the source of our redemption and our salvation. 
only by the grace of God are the powers of sin and death driven from the world. Only by the movement of the Holy Spirit are we dragged toward your kingdom, where you will reign in glory, justice, and mercy. Teach us to forsake all other powers so that we might live in service to you alone. Amen.